Well, welcome to the Convene podcast. I am super excited to have you with us, Russ. Uh, you have been in this business for a long time. The executive vice president at Ron Blue Trust, chief mission officer, hired in 1980, the second employee of Ron Blue himself. And you've worked in financial planning, uh, in, in estate planning, philanthropy, generational wealth transfer. And I love that you're currently advocating for the heart and soul and mission of the organization to make sure it's passed down to the next generation. You've written, uh, let's see, four books, if I have the, the number right, Your Life Well Spent, The Truth About Money Lies, What Makes a Leader Great, and Your Money Made Simple. So I'm excited because I think some people that are listening to us today, especially you, are going to change course because of what they hear. So welcome to the Convene Podcast. Well, Greg, thanks for having me. I really have enjoyed getting to know you over the last few years and appreciate what you're doing at Convene and look forward to sharing with your constituency. Sweet. Well, we're going to talk about three things, estate planning, succession planning, and philanthropy. And why don't we start with estate planning? You, you and I have spoken with hundreds of business owners. Some are doing well with their estate planning. Some are not. Uh, what are some of the pitfalls you've seen that uh, cause people to stumble? And as people are listening, what could they do to change course if they find themselves not in a good spot? Well, Greg, thanks for asking. I'm going to give the listeners two P words. The mistake we find is that people forget that estate planning is a process, not a product. So many people get their wills done and many people listening to this may have wills and think, well, I'm done. But unfortunately, what they've overlooked and, and many times to their own detriment is the fact that their business has changed, their families changed, circumstances have changed. And so the biggest mistake I see that people make is they they probably hopefully have wills, but then they kind of put them on the shelf and think, oh, I'm done. Unfortunately, to him, much has been given, much is required. And the more you have success in your business, and the more your family matures, the more you need to go back and relook at it. I just was with a longtime client, 35-year business owner client, and we just had his wills redone here a month ago. And we sat there at the table and he had them signed. And he um, is using some trust now where he wasn't before because of some marriage issues with these kids. And so I think, Greg, that's that's the biggest thing I would say to the listeners is don't think that because you and I had another guy come in just recently and his wills were 30 years old and some of the people in the will were already were dead. They weren't even able to fulfill their function and only had two of his four kids. So I think that's the biggest thing is realize that it's a process and that that if you if God chooses to bless you in your business, you got to revisit this every now and then. And um, as your kids move through their you know teen years and whatnot, I mean, I just that'd be the biggest thing. Don't think that you're done. And that's a mistake people make is they think, well, I've, one guy told me one time, he says, I, I have wills, but they may even be lost. Oh, my. Yeah, that was his comment to me. It's like, and he was worth multiple millions of dollars. And I'm like, OK, but, you know, I think, uh, Greg, unfortunately, people sometimes think if I deal with this, I'm going to die. I mean, it's kind of like I don't want to really talk about this. But um, like I said, to him, it must have been given much is required. And unfortunately, you have to engage in it. And I'll say one other thing right there. There's a phrase we like to say with our clients to the degree there's wealth. If there's not intentional communication about the wealth, it's tantamount to withholding affection. So what that means is you're going to have a family meeting at some point to discuss your estate. The question is whether or not you're going to be there. You either have the meeting around the coffin or around the coffee table. And so just recently, I had, to, I had my third family meeting with my family, and I explained my 40-year financial history, my 40-year spiritual history. And one of the daughter-in-laws came up and said, hey, it's really, that was really good to learn that. We wish you would write that down. So, so, Greg, I think that people listening need to realize that it's not just these documents, but you're, you're able to pass on values and communicate to your children and grandchildren and point them to God. You didn't just get where you got overnight. You took risks. You did things. You, you, know, you leveraged your house to start the business, whatever. And your kids and grandkids need to hear these stories. And that's part of the estate planning process is you getting your wills done, but then communicating that to your kids. I was at a family meeting in Florida one time. One of the grandkids went up to the granddad and said, I'm really glad you shared that. We didn't think you ever worked. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but, but you think about it. You grew up in this family and you maybe have some wealth and 
you don't realize the, the hard times um, that mom and dad and grandma and grandpa might have gone through to get there. So I think it's a process, not a product. And then it's a it's a it's a platform to have intentional communication to your heirs about your values and, and to point them to God. That'd be what I would say there, because, you know, and like I want to say again, family meetings are not optional. The only thing optional about them is whether you're going to be a participant or if it's going to be after your funeral. So, Greg, I would think that that's an important thing to remember. I like the uh, coffee table or coffin. It does sound really much better to have it around the coffee table um, than uh, with you not present lying flat out in the coffin. Well, let me say one other thing. So like I said, I've had, I've had, let, me, let me make one other comment. I've had three family meetings with my family. I have three boys and three daughter-in-laws. And after the last meeting, Greg, I said, you know, guys, I'm going to hire somebody to facilitate the next meeting. Because even though I could do it, you know, they started cutting up and doing stuff. So it's important many times to have a third party help you as a patriarch facilitate this meeting. Mm -hmm. So even though I've done this for 40 years and I could run the meeting, after the last time I said, okay, I'm hiring somebody in our family office division to run the next meeting because it'll just be that much more effective. I like it. Um, there's some people listening who've never even heard of this notion of having a family meeting. They they really do, all kidding aside, think that the family meeting is going to happen after they die because that's when, uh, just like in the movies, uh, some lawyer opens the envelope and reads everybody the will and some laugh and some cry and whatever the case may be. And then the arguments start and it's not good. So what happens at a family meeting? Uh, just maybe a couple bullet points. Obviously, you share your values. You share... Do you share what is going to be the 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 dissemination of the funds? Yeah, so it depends on the age of your kids. So early on, if your kids are zero to twenty, you communicate principles and values and and help them understand things like foundations and just get them educated. When your kids are twenty to forty, you can begin to start laying in the numbers. And Greg, this is why it's an art, not a science. But at some point, you need to tell them the numbers because they're going to know the numbers. Okay. And so, but it depends on the family, depends on all that. But usually 20 to 40, you start getting, being more specific. And then after 40, you know, we found it really doesn't matter and, and they should know everything. Here's the thing. Your kids should not be surprised in that attorney's office. There should be nothing on the table in that attorney's office that they should not, you should not have already debriefed them on. They should not go in there and not have any idea. So my boys, last meeting I had, I gave them a notebook and in there were the wills my net worth, my home going process, my healthcare directive was all there. And I said, you know, here's the decisions you are going to have to make. You know, so I think, you know, you can't over communicate. Here's a mistake people make. They think, well, I can't tell them the numbers. Well, if you drop dead tomorrow, they're going to, the attorney's going to tell them the number. Right? What's the difference? What's the difference, right? So why don't you get ahead of it? So but, you know, you don't you don't tell your 16 year old they're going to be worth, you know, you get three million dollars. But you you help them understand, hey, there's responsibility. Mom and dad have to be good stewards. So that's why we're beginning to communicate to you um, these principles. And I, I'm pretty sure nobody uh, that you've consulted with has had a contract out on their life the day after a family meeting because a kid thought he was going to get a lot of money. So it's probably fine. No, but you know what you do uncover? Like we had one family say the kids didn't want the business. So we planned to give the business away to charity. Mm -hmm. By having the family meeting, we found out two of them really did want the business. Mm -hmm. Of course, they were mad at us because they thought we told the parents to give it away. But the point is, there's a principle in estate planning that the form of the asset should fit the skills of your kids. And in this case, the kids wanted the business in the, in the form of the business. And so they about made a huge mistake by giving it away. So family meetings should be a, end up being a dialogue. And this is why the third party is so important. They can go interview the kids. What do you think about that? And how are you feeling about that? And then they can blend the two, Gen 1 and Gen 2 together. Talk to the perilous, terrible thought of some people who say, I don't want to divide the money equally between all my kids because some of my kids, whatever. <laughs> well, it sounds easy to say, you know, love them equally and treat them uniquely. But my experience in 40 years, Greg, has been that you got to be very careful if it's unequal. And you sure should have the meeting and communicate why while you're here, because they equate that to love. 
And I like to say that God loved us when we weren't lovely. So this idea that I'm one kid's kind of wayward and one kid's tracking, so I'm going to treat them unequally. I've seen too many situations where the parents did that. And then the one that was tracking went off the deep end and the one that wasn't. So I think it's very rare you don't leave it equally. Yeah, apparently and, the prodigal came back. Yes. And so it's just that's just a tough thing. But my experience has been you need to err typically on equal. Now, maybe it may need to go into trust potentially like this family I just talked about. They're concerned about one child. So we just put it all in trust. So we didn't we didn't spotlight that one. So it's in the trust for all of them. But so there's some things you can do that way. But I just think, Greg, we here's what we do. We hide behind. I got to be a good steward. I can't give it to that child that may be wayward. Well, you don't know the end game. And what I like to say is, is what's the last thing you want them to hear from you? Oh, I knew dad didn't love me. He left me out of the will. Mm. So I, 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 I've watched this. I've, I've seen unequal distributions. And um, I'm not saying you can't do that. But just be very careful. Make sure you communicate it. And usually you err on equality. I remember the, a story from Saddleback Church where I attend where uh, Rick Warren hired somebody to lead the print prison ministry who had been in prison for many decades for murder. And he's now running the prison ministry for Saddleback Church. So anything can happen. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's let's switch gears for a, a moment to succession planning. Uh, you and I unfortunately have stories of this not going well where uh, the spouse didn't uh, understand how the business worked and he or she finds themselves uh, a widow or a widow, uh, yeah, finds themselves a, a, a widow. And so talk talk about that because I think uh, just like a lot of people don't have a will, a lot of people don't have a succession plan for their uh, sole proprietorship. Yeah, they need to realize that probably in most of their cases, that's their biggest asset on their net worth. And so they need to plan ahead and have buy sales and, you know, who's going to take over the business and do I really want my spouse in that position? And this is all things that have to be talked about. You know, do you have a key employee that's going to take it over? What's going to happen if I get hit by a turnip truck on the way home tonight? And I think um, here's what I would say to business owners. You are a caretaker of that business that God's allowed you to have. And so as a caretaker, part of your caretaking is to be thinking ahead about, I'm only successful if I have a successor. So who's that going to be? And how do I do that? And how do I take care of my family in the process? And I think here again, most people don't want to think about it because they think they're going to live forever. The graveyards are full of lots of indispensable men and women, Greg. And I think we got to realize that we're, we lead for a limited amount of time. We, we need to be a caretaker of whatever we're leading. And we need to re plan to replace ourselves. So the sooner you can find people that are better than you, that can carry on the mission of your company and, and invest in them, you know, you know, very rarely does the wife take it over or the, 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 the husband, if it's a wife's business, but you just need to plan ahead and think what's going to happen here, because that's usually your biggest asset. And if you don't do that, that value could be dissipated in your net worth. So you have a financial reason to do it, but you also don't want to frustrate your spouse you don't want to let this thing that you've invested in just kind of disappear because you didn't put in place buy sell agreements, um, intentional thinking about, all right, who's going to take the baton when I'm not here. Um, and I think that what I found to help people is this idea that you're a caretaker and guess what? You're not going to lead forever. So you got to be prepared if you're a steward before the Lord to hand that off. And so the sooner you find people, I remember the guy, that's now the president of our trust company. He was in a Bible study I did 20 years ago. And I said, don't go anywhere. I want you on my team because I saw his talent and skill. And so now you fast forward 20 years, he's been president now for the last five years. And it's just great. You want to find those people um, that that can carry it on and not be afraid of them. And that's, that's, that, that's a key leadership principle. Don't be afraid of strength in others. And so you want to find people better than you. If you don't do that, then you think it's about you and not the business. If you really care about the business, you're going to find people better than you. I sat on a plane one day next to a guy that was kind of stressed out, and uh, I will not share too many details so we don't identify this fine person somewhere in the United States, but he was pretty stressed out going to his flooded home in another city that he owned this home as a vacation property. And we talked about convene and people getting together as a group to work on problems and learn what God has to say about leadership. And 
he's, I said, so what's your business? And he shared what the business was. And he said, the problem is I work 60, 70 hours a week. And I said, how old are you? He said, I'm, I'm like 71 years old. And I said, well, why do you do that? And he, he said, well, I have two boys. And I said, well, are they interested in the business? He said, well, they work in the business, but one of them, one of them doesn't like the business. But I said, then why does he stay? And he says, because I pay him about three times more than the position is worth. I said, what about the other guy? He said, well, he couldn't run the business if his life depended on it. Well, I said, well, why does he stay? Oh, same reason. I pay him too much money. So, <laughs> oh, so here's a guy working 70 hours a week with two kids who he overpays and neither one of them are going to run the business. If he drops dead tomorrow while he's, um, you know, sucking water out of his flooded home. It's like, are you kidding me right now? And the sad thing is, Greg, that it doesn't help the boys either. And I think that's, here's what we got to remember. Here's what can help business owners is realize it's still just financial capital. You need, you need to treat your business just like if it was Coke stock or whatever, because it is just financial capital. And the problem is you have your name on it and you've put all this sweat equity in it. So somehow you've elevated it to being something instead of thinking, okay, I'm going to handle this in a way that pleases God. And even though I got my name on it, if I need to sell it or I need to convert it to a form, because in that situation, maybe he should convert that business to a form that helps his boys do what God's called them to do. You know, maybe, maybe they've shown signs. I had a guy one time, he was 40 years old, he's in his dad's restaurant business, and he finally went and did what God called him to do. But he was in the dad's business for the same reason, getting them paid a lot of money, but he wasn't happy. And finally, when he's in his 40s, he went and did what God called him to do. So patriarchs, Need, and business owners need to have the courage to be willing to convert their assets to a form that fits the skills of their recipients. And I've got three boys, one builds houses, one sells coffee, and one's in the business. So I need to leave my assets in a way that helps the one that builds houses and helps the one that sells coffee and not just say, hey, here you have to be. So I need to be thinking about how do I do that so I can help fan what God's called them to do. Mm -hmm. My kids are all artists and pastors, so Shelly and I just support them. <laughs> yep. well, you're letting them do what God's called them to do. And I, you know, for business owners, that's hard. Sometimes business owners, somehow they feel like if my kid's not interested in a business, I'm a failure. No, you're not. No, you're not. It's just God's wired them differently. And you need to be willing to help support them on their stage of action. Mm -hmm. Instead of just force, you, you've seen it, Greg, kids forced into the business against, they're not even good at it and they don't like it. And yet they probably have other things they could do if the dad would just give them the freedom to, hey, you do what God's called you to do. I want to fan that flame. Talk to the person who's listening, who says, um, you know, this all sounds like a lot of work for me to do. And I don't even know where to start. Uh, obviously, Ron Blue Trust helps people with those kinds of things. Can you just share about that for a minute? Yeah, I mean. Like I said, to him, much has been given, much is required. Most business owners are busy running their business. They don't have time to think about these things. And so they need somebody to come alongside and just delegate to them this thinking to apply the principles, to make sure you got your wills done and they're up to date and make sure that you've got the buy sales and make sure you've thought through the family thing. So what we simply do, Greg, is come alongside folks and just and just be their coach so they can go run the business. I have to think about this. We're thinking about it for them. We're making sure... Like that client I met with last month with the wills, he wasn't sitting around, but we brought the wills to the dining room table. We brought the notary over and we got them signed, you know? And so uh, you, people need coaches. Um, I've concluded that you're a good steward if you apply biblical principles and you allow yourself to be held accountable. So people need accountability because this stuff, it's it's not urgent. You probably got, it's not urgent, but but it's important. And so we just perform a consulting coaching role that just keeps reminding people, okay, I got the wills done. Oh, we got to, you know, we got to really talk about that son and see if he wants to come into the business. We need to go interview him and his, your, your daughter-in-law. I mean, this is the kind of things we do. When I started working with the Kathy family of Chick-fil-A years ago, I went and interviewed the three kids. Start off with just talking to them, what, you know, and that then informed a way forward. And now you fast forward, we're still doing stuff, you know, 20, 23 years on because, um, it's just a process, but you need somebody to guide the process and hold you accountable. I think this is still a sobering statistic, but I don't know the latest number. What is the percentage of people who run businesses or are Christians living life who do not have a will? 
you know, I'm going to guess, I don't know what statistic you've heard, but it's probably 70%. I'm guessing. I can't re remember the number. Yeah, I've heard 80%. So the chances are, uh, even though we're talking to Christian business owners that are listening, that for sure, at least half the people who are listening don't have a will. And that's not a good day. And, and but here's a, the state has a will for me. You need to know there's a, there's a will. The state has it. And, that, and they don't want that to go the way their state's going to tell them to go. You know, some to go to the wife, some to go to the kids. And so they want to take. And here's the thing. We can help them figure out what to do. This guy that came in last week, I said, OK, we're going to take these first steps. You don't have to figure everything out. We're going to redo your wills and we're going to give everything we can to your kids tax free and everything else goes to charity. Let's just make that step. Let's get that done. Because they're like, we don't know how much to leave to our kids. We're really struggling. Well, if I wait for them to answer that, we'll be another year, right? Let's get something done that's better than the 30-year-old wills you've got. And we're going to get those done by the middle of January. And then we'll start parsing it and being a little more specific about, was well, this the right number? So I think, Greg, you people just need somebody. They think it's real complicated. They got to sit down and talk to their wife and come up with all kinds of decisions. Not really. I mean, there's some decisions you can make pretty quickly and just get it done. So what we're going to do is we're going to send a letter to the attorney saying, do this. Mm -hmm. And and then, yeah. <clears throat> All right. We get to have some, this was fun so far, but we're going to even, even have some more fun philanthropy. And there's some people listening who are saying, oh, I give money to my church and I, I'm friends with the donor development person from ministry A, B, or C. We, you know, we go fishing or hunting together with the president of ministry A, B, or C, and it's it's really fun. And so I get to, you know, give them 10% of my money uh, in aggregation. But really, giving out of your cash flow is the least you can do. You can do more. Talk yeah. about more. Well, Greg, um, one of my great fears is for business owners, they're going to stand before God, and just say, how'd you do with what I gave you? And they're going to say just what you said. You know, I tithed on my salary. You know, I even gave 20% of my salary. In the meantime, their retirement plan was going up, their business was going up, and their real estate that's in their business is going up. And so their net worth was increasing hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And they're giving, maybe they make 500,000, they're giving 50,000. And the New Testament says, give according to your ability. Well, for a business owner and folks that have wealth, it's usually not in cash. It's usually not just in their cash flow. So for them to give according to the New Testament principle, according to their ability, they need to look at their asset side too. So let's say I make 500,000, I tithe 50, but let's say my business went up a million dollars. What am I, you know, God, what am I supposed to do about that? What happens to most business owners, Greg, is they don't want to think about it, so they just keep making money. And then they die and it all goes into a foundation or their kids have to give it away or whatever. And I would say, this is where it gets fun. Get in there and look at it. This guy I'm talking to, he, we gave away 10% of his business years ago. It was going up, going up, going up. We gave 10% to a donor advice fund. His son who came into the business bought it back. So there's ways you can integrate estate planning and succession planning and philanthropy planning and give according to your ability. But you're going to have to not just look at your paycheck. You have to look at that you know, retirement plan going up, those, the real estate. Yeah, I can't tell you how many people I meet with. And they, they start talking about their assets. And it's, oh, yeah, I got that real estate, <laughs> you know, and that building's worth six million, that building's worth a million, whatever. And what am I going to do about that? Because when God says, how'd you do with what I gave you? It's not just your cash flow. So I think, and, and, but it takes planning, Greg, because it's, you have to figure out, well, how do I give away a percentage of my company? Or how do I give away a percentage of that real estate or a piece of that, a piece of that um, LLC? And I would say to people listening, you can do that. Most people don't think that they can give away stuff like that, but they can. There's ways to give away assets. It just takes a little more planning. Talk to the person who doesn't understand some of the basics. Maybe they're with a, a secular financial planner and the sec secular financial planner is really happy to have their $4 million and a broker fund and they don't need the money and they are not sure what you're talking about, but they'd sure love to do something about it. Well, you got 4 million. So you got 4 million in your uh, brokerage account and it of course, this past year, it might went down some, but the years before that, it was going up 10 or 15%. So let's say that 4 million becomes 4.4 million. And you can give away that growth, avoid the capital gain tax. So you could give, say it went from 4 million to 4.4 million. You could give away 400,000, you'd avoid probably 80,000 in capital gain tax. And then you get a deduction for it, which saves you another 30%. So you may be able to make a $400,000 gift at a cost of maybe 200,000. 
And if you don't need it anyway. So, so I think, Greg, that's the that's the fun thing about this is to look at your assets and say, hey, and I would say to the listener, if you've got something that's appreciated, you know, that piece of land you've had for 30 years and you paid 10000 for it and now it's worth 500 you're thinking, I can't sell it. I'm going to pay capital gain tax. Well, yeah, you could give it away and no capital gain tax mm-hmm. and have a whole 500 to give away to somebody. So I just, here's what I've, I would say. Secular advisors will not bring in the philanthropic piece because they want to get paid on the pile. And why would I want the pile to ever go down? And And I would say that as a steward, if I want to manage my business and my assets well, I've got to think about giving according to how I've been prospered. So we've done this for 40 years, Greg. We've helped people maximize their generosity and give away you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they all come back with the same thing. Man, I didn't know I could do it. And then they never go broke. It's kind of an interesting thing. It's like <laughs> you can't outgive God. And so they get more generous and then their business does well. And so it's not a health, wealth, prosperity thing, but it's it's just interesting to watch when people add philanthropic tools to their toolbox. Exactly. Well, somebody's listening who probably says, okay, um, you've said enough that interests me. What can I do? What what can they do? Who can they call at Ron Blue? Well, I thought you said I was going to show up on here, but I can tell them they can email info at ronblue.com. Info at ronblue.com. Or they can call 800-987-2987. 800 800 9872987 Great and we will put that in the lower thirds on the final product so you'll uh, see that right down there now as you're listening ronblue.com is the website Yep um <clears throat> Russ I'm pretty sure that there are hundreds of millions of dollars you know more than I but hundreds of millions of dollars that have already flowed into kingdom causes because of the work that you do and the work that your team does at Ron Blue Trust but now I hope there'll be a little bit more as a result of our time today. And uh, I'm excited to do some regional events with you in 2023, Chicago, Fort Lauderdale, Dallas, Los Angeles. Go to convenenow.com to find out about those dates and locations. They're all throughout 2023. And if you're listening and somehow you haven't heard about Convene, we're a place where Christian business owners help each other to build incredible businesses on a biblical platform. And you can find out more about Convene at convenenow.com. But for now, we'll sign off and say thanks, Russ Crossan at Ron Blue Trust for the work that you do and for being with us today. Greg, thanks for having me. It's been great and just appreciate the work you all do and ministering to business owners. Thank you.